guys, it's Superintendent Bradley here at Brake Center State Park and uh, we know that a lot of you all are kind of stuck at home right now during the uh, issues with COVID-19. So we wanted to take a moment to just do a brief guided hike on a, a trail system here at the park that starts at the State Line Overlook and we call it the Chestnut Ridge Guided Trail. The reason why we call it a guided trail is it's actually is a self-guided trail that has markers that are placed throughout the length of the trail and those markers correspond with a really neat little trail guide that we have that's actually accessible on our breakspark.com webpage via the COVID-19 link. And, uh, and each of these markers denotes something very special about this trail and the area, uh, either historical facts, um, facts about the geology, the botany, or the wildlife of the area. We invite you to come along with us today. This would be an excellent thing to do with your kids, you know, while they're out of school or just a way to get out and get some exercise and de-stress and learn something uh, that you may not know about Brakes Interstate Park. We're now standing near marker number two here on the Chestnut Ridge Guided Trail. And uh, the reason that this marker is in place and also this interpretive sign to my left here is they talk about the forest that we're kind of standing in the middle of right now. We're on a ridge top in the Appalachian Mountains. And, and so the forest here is dominated by an oak hickory forest. Uh, they, they kind of um, crowd out a lot of the underbrush and, and under canopy with their, uh, with their shade. The park is very interesting from a biodiversity standpoint in that we have a lot of different species of trees and plants that reside here in the park. This marker, marker number two, specifically talks about all the different oak species that we have in the park. There are around 10 different species of oak just in Kentucky and Virginia alone and then there are 60 around 60 in North America. One of the other neat things that that I like about standing here and kind of uh, imagining what it would have looked like over a hundred years ago is that you know while oak and hickory dominate today back around the turn of the century before the uh, before the chestnut blight decimated all of the American chestnut trees this would have been a much different landscape. Uh, instead of kind of the relatively smaller oak and hickory, uh, this entire area would have been probably dominated by just really dense, vast stands of American chestnut. American chestnuts are really interesting but because of the mast production, the, the nuts that they reliably produce each year. It, it's really hard to imagine the toll that that took on the people that were living at that time and, uh, and also the wildlife that populated this area uh, because they heavily relied on the American chestnut for food each fall in the same way that they rely on oak and hickory trees today. Uh, both the Kentucky Department of Forestry and the Virginia Department of Forestry uh, have some really, really great online resources uh, for tree identification uh, that, that are specific to this area. Um, so I really encourage everyone to check those out. Okay guys, now we find ourselves a little further down the ridge here at markers uh, four, which is just over out of the camera on the right side of the trail, and markers five, which uh, is just up above me here. What these markers are meant to uh, kind, of, kind of indicate is the difference between rhododendron and mountain laurel here in the park. Uh, right behind me here is a rhododendron bush. Uh, they're, they're evergreen. There are two different species in the park. Uh, there's the Catawba and the Rose Bay rhododendron. Um, they really kind of burst into bloom all over the park, especially right here around State Line Overlook and Nature Drive, anywhere from mid-May all the way through July. You can, you can see them in bloom. Their blooms range from white to pink to lavender in some cases, depending on the species. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're doing this video in April, uh, so it's still about a month away from really starting to see much in the way of rhododendron blooms. 
but it's something to look forward to this spring. These two species of plants are often mistaken for each other, uh, but the reason why we chose to do the shot here is to uh, show you uh, also over to my left here is, is mountain laurel. And a lot of people call this ivy. Um, some people actually call it spoonwood. And uh, the reason why they call it spoonwood is because the roots of mountain laurel are very uh, easy to work with. They're very pliable when it's freshly dug. Um, so it's, you know, kind of verbal oral tradition has it that Native Americans and early settlers would use it to form some of their more intricate wooden utensils and tools that required uh, bending, um, things like spoons, uh, you know, it, it, just different items like that that required the ability to, for the wood to be pliable. And then it actually, when it's dried out, it, it forms a very hard, smooth finish. So uh, mountain laurel is smaller than rhododendron. The leaves are smaller. Um, it blooms typically anywhere, somewhere around mid-May mid and uh, can go all the way through July as well. Its blooms are much smaller than rhododendron. Uh, it, some people actually call it calico bush, if you've ever heard, heard that name applied to it. And, and the reason why is the blooms are, are, you know, when you look at them from a distance, they appear white. But when you get up close, you can see these, these really intricate, beautiful uh, patterns of, of purple spots on them. So um, again, there are two major types of kind of evergreen bushes here in the park, uh, which are of course rhododendron, which is larger and behind me, and mountain laurel, which is smaller, and, and a lot of folks refer to it by the name of ivy. We're now at a point where the trail has started to descend down a hill and uh, we've, we've come upon marker number nine. And the reason that this marker is in place is to, to uh, kind of indicate the presence of the yellow poplar tree, which is uh, the tree that I have my hand on here. This is a much smaller example of, you know, of this species than what actually can still be found in the park. There are still some pretty large specimens within the park. And, and especially if you went back to the uh, turn of the century, the late 1800s, early 1900s, there were just some uh, enormous specimens that, that were located here in the park. Um, this species of poplar, particularly yellow poplar, were so important that there was a lumber company or a timber company that were actually, that was named after this species. It was the Yellow Poplar Timber Company. And it was active in this region here in the park, on park property and between Hayside and Elkhorn City, again, from, from about the period starting in the, in the late 1800s all the way up through the 1930s. And the reason that they were so active is because there was such a, a large abundance of these poplar trees here and they were particularly useful at that time because they, they were very large, really large in diameter, not many branches at all, very straight, and they were very uh, heavily utilized for construction during that period of time. It's a softer wood than, than like oak or hickory, that, that kind of thing, but because of the fact that it grows up so straight and tall, over 200 feet, in some cases, and it has no very few branches, um, it made excellent logs for construction during that period of time. Uh, when you think of, back to some of those early foresters and what they, the conditions that they had to deal with here, uh, there were no roads really to speak of in this area at that time. Uh, the Clinchfield Railroad had yet to be constructed. So really the only way to get the, the massive numbers of trees out that they were that they were harvesting was to utilize the river. They, they had to get them out of the area to market in Catlettsburg, Kentucky, where the sawmill was located, and they were forced to use the Russell Fork River. Anyone who has ever seen the Russell Fork know knows that um, you know at low flows, it's just really the river basically disappears in, in amongst all the boulders and rocks in the way and it's not really a good channel at all 
to float logs out, out of the gorge here in the park. So they came up with a concept called a splash dam. And, uh, and there's actually a community located in Dickinson County called Splash Dam that gets its name from this kind of uh, invention that they created. And, and what a splash dam was, was a temporary dam, uh, in some cases made of, of concrete, but in most cases made completely of wood. And, and what they would do is they would dam up the river and, uh, and create a large pool behind the dam and they would pull all of their logs into that large, that large pool of water behind the dam. And once they had gotten it completely full, they would either open the gates on the splash dam, if it were a more permanent structure, or they would utilize dynamite to completely just blow it up. And the massive wave of water that would result from that would, would actually carry the logs past all the boulders in the gorge down to Elkhorn City, Kentucky, where they were um, where they were tied together in rafts, and then uh, and then employees of the timber company would actually brand them in that location, and and ride those rafts all the way down to Catletsburg, Kentucky, where they would be delivered to the sawmill. We've now descended down to marker 17, which is an area, which is in an area here in the park that we call the Notches. Um, you'll, you'll actually see it on your park map and it's, uh, it's named the Notches. And it is named this because of basically the notches that have been formed in the sandstone, uh, the sandstone rock here behind me. It's a really great place to see the effects of erosion in action here in the park. So uh, you may be able to hear the stream in the background and, and it's called Laurel Branch. It actually runs out of the bottom of our lake here in the park. And over, over thousands and thousands of years, Laurel Branch during periods of, of high flows and, and just its regular flows, has actually eroded this area down through the sandstone and, and cut into the rock. The evidence of that you may be able to see behind me here is in the cross bedding of the rock here. You can see these lines. Of course, this is sandstone rock, which is made essentially by, by sand and sediment that is cemented together and over the ages has hardened to form, form a rock layer. The evidence of the erosion in that can be seen in all the, all the lines called cross bedding here in these cliffs. The notches is, is really just a, a smaller model or a smaller example of the, of the erosive action that's at work in the, in the Russell Fork Gorge, which is the deepest gorge east of the Mississippi River. And really the, the reason that Brakes Interstate Park was formed was to protect the Russell Fork Gorge. The erosion that you can see evidence of here behind me in the notches it is also what formed the Russell Fork Gorge uh, as the Russell Fork over, over ages has ground its way down through the sandstone in this area to form the deepest gorge east of the Mississippi River. One of the other great things about this area that, that again is called the Notches here in the park is that it is a perfect example of, of what we call and what is commonly known as a rock shelter. Um, so essentially what those are, the, the breaks and, and the region surround it has primarily sandstone rock. We don't have a lot of limestone. So, you know, in, in areas with large abundance of limestone and, and karst formations, um, you, get, you get caves and caverns. Um, here in sandstone country, you don't really have a, a lot of uh, caves and caverns because of course sandstone is eroded by water but it's not dissolved by water. So what you do get and what, what you see are these rock shelters, which are essentially sheltered overhangs where the, where the cliff hangs out over an area and, uh, and provides a shelter where Native Americans uh, on hunting expeditions and also early settlers exploring the area could take shelter from the elements. These areas are typically good places to, uh, you know, for archaeologists to look for evidence of, uh, of, you know, past people that came before. 
Um, it is worth noting that within the park, uh, within most lands in Kentucky and Virginia, especially public lands, that artifacts like that are protected and that it's against the law for the general public to try to excavate those areas um, and against the law to keep any artifact that might be found. But again, these are still great areas. It, it, it's, it's really interesting to think about the people who may have come before us, both Native Americans and early settlers who may have taken shelter under these cliffs. So now we've moved through the Notches area, a little farther down the trail, and we find ourselves here at the intersection of the Laurel Branch and the Geological Trail. As soon as you start on the Geological Trail from the Laurel Branch side, you encounter markers 19 and 20. Uh, both of those are really interesting because they, they uh, indicate different facts about the hemlock tree, which is uh, here just to my right. And as you can see, this hemlock tree has a very narrow perch on, on the sandstone outcropping here beside me. Uh, the reason why we have a, a marker here is we just thought, you know, number one, the tree is very visually kind of uh, interesting. And then the other thing is, is it's really just amazing in the park here how you can find different examples of trees that even with the, with the very smallest toehold on a rock, how they can, uh, if their basic needs of, of sunlight and carbon dioxide and water and just a very small amount of soil are met, how they can essentially grow on these rock faces. And, uh, and when I see that, I'm always reminded of, you know, just kind of the resilience and the tenacity that you find in nature. And, and that makes me proud to be from this area because I feel like our people uh, from the mountains are like that too. Another, another important thing about this tree is it's an eastern hemlock, um, which are, are very common in the park. They're very common throughout our region. The, the natural community down here in, in the bottom of this, this uh, kind of drainage that we're in right now is called uh, the Acidic Cove natural community. So we've kind of, we've, we've went down the ridge from kind of the oak hickory dom dominated forest and we're seeing a lot more rhododendron, a lot more hemlock, different species of trees that kind of flourish in wet, damp, acidic conditions. Another interesting but kind of, I guess, sad or unfortunate fact about eastern hemlock trees are they are under attack right now by, uh, by an insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that insect, but it's, it's been responsible for a lot of dieback in, in hemlock stands around the, uh, around the nation, especially in the eastern United States. And there are areas in, in national parks, in the, in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and elsewhere around our region where you just have these enormous stands of dead hemlocks that have succumbed to the hemlock woolly adelgid. Biologists and botanists for a long time, for several years now, have been commenting on the fact that despite the uh, woolly adelgid being present here in the park, that our hemlock trees still remain in, in really good condition. And, and our staff is doing various things with, with a few of the trees to try to make sure that we, if there is a large dieback, that we at least preserve some of them. But we're just not seeing the dieback in other areas. So there's a lot of question right now as to why our hemlocks are doing so well and hemlocks in other areas are not doing as well. But whatever that reason, we're, we're happy that, that hemlocks like the one here, this one is relatively small compared to some of the other ones that you'll find along the geological trail. Uh, there is a really great example of just a, a massive hemlock farther on down the geological trail near an area that we call the Fallen Arch. And that one is just amazing. It's a very majestic tree. But we're happy that our hemlocks are doing as well as they are. And we're gonna do everything that we can among our staff to make sure that they continue to do well in the future.
we're a little farther down the geological trail now, just past the intersection with the Laurel Branch Trail, and, and we've stopped in this area to introduce you all to a spot under the cliffs that divide the ridge trail up above us from the geological trail where we're standing. And, and the reason why this area is interesting is because we, we call it a rock apron. And, and basically, you know, what that term is used to indicate is if you've ever driven on the roads in Appalachia, especially during periods of freeze and thaw, you're familiar with rocks on the road. And of course, the highway department comes along and, and clears those off. Well, here in the park, over, over thousands of years, that, free, that same freeze and thaw cycle has been going on. And, uh, and of course, we try to keep the rocks out of the trail, but the rocks are just allowed to accumulate at the base of the cliffs here. And, and, and that forms an area called a rock apron along the base of the cliffs. These areas are interesting because all, all of these rocks trap leaf debris, they trap old branches, dead branches from trees, things like that. And over many, many years, soil builds up between the, the cracks of the rocks. And especially during the spring, you can just now start to see it, this is early spring, but it's an excellent place to allow for the growth of wildflowers and ferns. So they tend to be below the cliff lines in sunny areas and these areas we refer to as rock aprons tend to be excellent areas to, uh, to identify and spot wildflowers, different species of ferns, and also various other plants that grow here in the park. We're now standing at one of the most interesting places, in my opinion, on the entire Brakes Interstate Park trail system. We're standing at marker 22 on the geological trail, and we're standing at the base of what was at one time, geologists think, a natural arch or a natural bridge behind me. Um, over time, as the freeze and thaw cycle and the, uh, the erosion from, from wind and water uh, continue to wear away at the rock, uh, the natural bridge collapsed, and what we're left with are two very large arms of rock kind of extending out to each other and the floor of what would have been the natural arch or the natural bridge lying right down in between all of it. So you could almost visualize how these large boulders and, and pieces of rock would almost fit up into that opening. It, it, it almost looks like a piece of a puzzle that would just fit into place and, and complete the natural arch. And, we can only imagine how long ago this took place, but um, I love this area because the trail runs right through the middle of the arch, so it's, it's very scenic, but as you can see behind me, it's, it's very large, so it really gives you a, a perspective on how small we are compared to uh, some of the scenic features here in the park. And there are also some great examples of, of what are not, not necessarily old growth forest, but some very large specimens of hemlock trees and also poplar trees right here in this immediate area. So in terms of just kind of visual uh, appeal in the entire park, this area is one of the most beautiful and it's located really on a, on a moderate to easy hike right here in the middle of the geological trail. We've moved along the geological trail uh, past the natural arch to marker number 26. And the reason that marker 26 is here is to uh, denote the presence of, of court, white quartz in the sandstone conglomerate of the cliffs here. Um, it, it would be very easy to pass by this area because of course quartz pebbles are small and if you're not looking for that detail within the rock, it would be very easy to just walk right by this. The interesting thing about the quartz pebble in this rock, in, in the sandstone here at the, on the rim of the gorge, is that quartz does not naturally occur in this area. So the, the closest um, source for naturally occurring quartz is, is actually the Blue Ridge Mountain Range. And then the quartz that occurs here in the breaks is thought to come from really uh, the, the northern portion of that range from around the Canadian border. And 
has somehow found its way here. Geologists think that, uh, that this occurred uh, when, the, uh, when the area was covered by a shallow inland sea. The water currents actually carried the quartz here. Another thing that's really interesting about, about the quartz is that the quartz has been rounded as if by, uh, as, you, as you see on rocks and, and, and stones, by the erosion action of water. So that, that is another thing that kind of supports the theory that at one time this area was covered by a shallow inland sea, and that sea carried the quartz pebbles hundreds of miles from their origin, uh, probably in the northern portion of the Blue Ridge Mountain Range, uh, to this area where they became embedded in the, in the cliff line here on the rim of the uh, Russell Fort Gorge. At this point, we've uh, we've kind of almost come to the end of our of our hike today here on the Ridge Trail Geological Trail Loop. If you go onto our website, you can actually find a link to uh, to a guide that corresponds to the markers that I've talked about today and some others. But we just thought that this would be an appropriate place to to take one last shot. At, and just show you some of the very unique geology that you'll find along our trails here in the park. The Prospector's Trail, which remains open at this time, and the Geological Trail are probably two of the best areas to, to find features like the one that I'm standing in, which is just kind of a, a narrow slot between, between the rock in the cliff face here that the trail passes directly in between. Um, so these slots are formed by erosion, by wind and water, and then also they're formed as, as the mountain was taking shape uh, in the process of, of orogeny or, or the uh, origin of mountains, the building of mountain building, I think the word goes back to. As these mountains took shape, uh, of course there was a lot of shifting that happened uh, that opened up cracks in the rocks. There are various areas, again, on the Prospector's Trail, the Geological Trail around Pinnacle Rock, where you can actually find um, slots in the rock, like the one I'm standing in, um, or actually just windows in the rock, where it, they're large enough for a person to pass through, but it's a completely enclosed uh, rock window, just a space in the rock big enough for a person to fit through. So. Um, there are all kinds of hidden areas like this throughout the park. Um, we're keeping it open so that our local folks have a place to exercise and unwind. And, and honestly, the, the sense of uh, just excitement that I get when I get out and explore and find a place like this, it makes periods of boredom or anxiety much easier to deal with when, when you have a beautiful area that you can get out and explore. So. Uh, with that being said, we appreciate you all for joining us on our hike today. Uh, we hope to see you out on the trails and on the overlooks in small groups of less than 10 and six feet away from each other. But from the Brakes Interstate Park, thank you for joining us and we hope everyone has a, a great day.